Kia ora everyone, welcome to this Good Fellow Unit webinar on the all-important six-week baby check. With us today speaking is Karen Hoare, who's the Associate Professor and a Nurse Practitioner for Children and Young People. Now I'm going to pass it over to Karen to start our talk this evening. Thank you very much, Helen. Kia ora, everybody. So I'm very pleased that you're all joining me to talk about the all-important six-week check. Um, please do ask questions as we go along. If, you've, if I'm saying anything that you're not quite sure about or you just want, need to, um, I need to clarify some of the things I'm talking about. So this is the outline of the presentation. Um, I'll talk about the purpose of the six-week check, the, the examination neurological and physical of the infant. I won't forget the mother because uh, we shouldn't forget the mum and how we manage abnormal findings and then putting it all together. I will be talking about immunizations and this is very much my personal systematic um, view of how I do a six week check. So let's start by saying that uh, the mother and the baby at six weeks are a dyad and I am very reluctant for us to enroll a baby at six weeks if the mother isn't enrolled with us as well because it's difficult to care for one without the other. So with the mother, I'm thinking about her mental health, her physical health, and the social support she has, which is very important at this, at this very vulnerable time, particularly if it's the first baby. With the baby, I'm looking at the general um, health and well-being of the baby as um, the mother comes in. And I want to know family history, if there's anything that I need to know about that will direct me for looking to look more closely at various aspects of the six week check. I do want to know about feeding. Um, if I only have time to do a very perfunctory six weeks check, six week, six week check, these are the things that I know have evidence based that I need to tick off at that six week mark because they are time um, sensitive in terms of baby's development. But if I've got time, I'm going to do a top to toe exam. Now I can do all of these things in half an hour with and include the immunizations if the mother's okay and everything goes well with the check. The object of introducing the baby at six weeks is to is it might be the start of a lifelong connection with the baby with the general practice and the, this becomes the baby's medical home. And of course, immunizations are so important. So I take a systematic approach. Um, I want to know how the labor went. Um, I do acknowledge the support person, whether it's the partner or the mother or the mother-in-law, whoever's come with the, the mum and the baby. I'm always admiring of the baby because that's really important. Look at the baby and say, oh, isn't it lovely, sweet, beautiful eyes, long eyelashes, lots of hair. Um, I explain the process of what I'm going to do. Then I'll examine the baby first, then immunize, then assess the mom, then provide lots of reassurance. And most importantly, I'll make sure that there's a follow up, either um, if everything's fine, make sure that the next immunization visit is in page 21 of the Well Child book written in and also ask them to put the next immunization visit on the telephone, on their mobile phone. Now we've, um, at the end of this talk, I have provided a list of resources because what we've found with this method is that our immunization rates rarely drop below 94%. So, um, and this is what we do, not lots of um, paper, um, call outs, what do you call them? Paper um, reminders. So we have an aid memoir on our MedTech system, which is um, found through the screening template. If anybody wants me to uh, demonstrate how we do this after this talk, I can send an email and ha explain how we set up this six six week template. And it just reminds me of all the things that I need to ask. Uh, you'll see there that we've got vitamin D. Um, we started to give all our breastfed babies 
Purea, which became available um, from Pharmac the beginning of last year, beginning of 2019. Prior to that, we were a bit reluctant to give Vitadol C because of the vitamin A. Purea is, is just vitamin D. Um, yes, yeah, so particularly dark skinned infants. We've got the um, sheet from uh, the Ministry of Health that Helen will make, make available that uh, um, explains why vitamin D is so important. We'll put up that resource on our website afterwards. Thanks, Helen. The other piece of you, a very useful information is the Well, well Child book. And hopefully um, the mums may be uh, filled in the what is your baby doing page at four to six weeks. I ask, always ask for this book because if, if what the Well Child Tamariki Aura service has been recently, I'll just transfer their weight, height and head circumference into the baby's um, growth centile charts in the MedTech system. Now it's important, I think, to always uh, document the birth weight too, so that we've got a um, baseline, we've got baseline measures for birth weight and also for six week, for the six week check. We want to know that the baby's definitely come back to its birth weight by this stage. Um, I can't remember the last time when I saw a baby who hadn't by the time they were six weeks. But again, there's um, lots of questions on that, well, the lots of um, pointers on that four to six week assessment that remind you to ask about, did the baby have vitamin K when it was born? Um, had they had their neonatal hearing screening? And um, of course, immunizations. Now, the other thing that we have used in our practice is the safe sleeping. And this was, this was a uh, research project, but it's such a useful um, aid memoir again, reminding me to talk about how babies sleep. Now, I was made very aware of how sometimes we can perfunctorily talk about safe sleeping when Quite a few years ago, I was doing a um, quiz for the Goodfellow website, and we used a um, coroner's report from a baby who died of Sudi. And what the coroner's report demonstrated was that although this family had seen, this family with this poor baby that had died, had seen numerous health professionals, they had perfunctorily talked about safe sleeping. They hadn't really gone into it in any depth. So. I think it's really important that at the six week check you do emphasize the importance of not co-sleeping um, only if somebody's in awake in the bed, if your partner's awake, then have the baby in bed with you. But uh, wahakuras, peppy pods um, and the value of them. Um, so the next thing is. I always undress the baby so that I can have a good look at it as I'm undressing it and trying to engage it, asking the mum if, if it's smiling, if it's um, trying to make sure that it can see my face and follow my face through 90 degrees um, and hopefully elicit, elicit a smile. And then I start with the top and work down. So feeling the fontanelle, um, looking at the eyes, um, looking in the mouth, putting a finger in the mouth just to make sure the palate's um, intact, listening to the heart, feeling the abdomen, looking at the umbilicus, checking the hips, and then you turning the baby over and looking at them in ventral suspension. Uh, this, this helps to demonstrate that they're neurologically normal, that they can keep their head in a, a plane with their uh, back, with their bodies, um, the smiling and the watching the tone of the baby demonstrates too that they're neurologically normal. Um, watching to make sure they're moving all of their limbs. And then onto the head, parents get, oh, mums and parents get, get quite concerned about the fontanelle. So just explaining the fontanelle to them 
making sure um, the head circumference is measured at this um, at this check. So going into more depth now, the specific um, important checks that you need to do. And the red reflex is really important because this is a time sensitive test for if you do it, if you do find that something's not quite right. Um, for the eye examination, the room light should be dimmed or off. The ophthalmoscope light should be bright and set to the largest white light circle. The lens should be set to zero or to the examiner's prescription if they've taken their glasses off. And the infant can be positioned either on the carer's lap with the infant's head against their abdomen. Alternatively, the infant can be held like in picture one um, with the carer's uh, against the carer's chest supported with one hand under the infant's bottom um, or over the shoulder. Now, I always find it's easier for uh, to if you've got a baby who won't open its eyes, it's easier to get them to open their eyes if they're over the shoulder, like the second picture. There is um, a maneuver called the, uh, the doll's eye phenomenon. If you move the baby's head from side to side, they will then open their eyes. Um, it's good to stand at an arm's length away and try and locate both of the eyes through the ophthalmoscope so that you can compare the two of them. Um, any kind of uh, concerns, and I'll, oh, first of all, looking, looking this is demonstrating that uh, babies often have wide epicanthic folds and they look like they might have a strip business, but if you look, the light reflex demonstrates that this baby is seeing perfectly straight uh, with with just a um, more conjunctiva that is visible on the temporal side of the cornea. So this is a normal light reflex. But these are abnormalities of the eye examination that need uh, immediate referral. And, and the ptosis, because it's actually covering the pupil, so that baby's uh, going to have poor vision development. Retinoblastoma. Um, I, I often ask the uh, parents too if they've been taking photographs of the baby, if they can see the red sometimes when they've taken photographs. Uh, we have, I've personally known somebody whose baby was picked up through that with a retinoblastoma. And then congenital cataracts. I've referred in probably the last 10 years two babies to Green Lane, which is our local eye clinic for um, query congenital cataracts. Fortunately, uh, neither of them were. This is um, the case where it's really important to have a family history because 23% of congenital cataracts are familial or there's a family history of them. Karen, sorry, someone's yeah. just asked, which is the abnormal eye and the retinoblastoma? So can you explain? Yeah, that? sure. So the red eye is perfectly normal. So you can see the beautiful red uh, of the retina at the back of the eye and uh, on the so if it's on the right eye of the baby uh, that's the leucoria that's the um, you can't see the retina because of the retinoblastoma so on a normal baby you'd see two red eyes completely mm. yes two beautiful red eyes like the one on the mm. the right and you can see on the congenital cataract in the picture below is the right eye again. So the left eye, perfectly black pupil, and then the right eye, you can see a, uh, a little spot. Um, anything that there is a, there's a number of issues that um, infants can have with their eyes. Um, I know of a, a little baby who had a, a coloboma and the mum just mentioned it to the doctor in passing when she was breastfeeding him because she could look down and saw that his eye looked like it wasn't quite normal as she was looking at him uh, just breastfeeding it looked perfectly all right while you were looking at him full on face on so it, it's important to check these um, 
check the eyes because of the what could happen if you don't and, and leave it. Um, I did have a statistic about just one week can make a difference to the baby's vision. Sorry, Karen, can you yeah. ask one more question? What would the red reflex look like when you had a congenital cataract? So if you were doing your red eye. Right, eyes. okay, so the congenital cataract, um, if you look, you can't really see it as well in the picture that's got congenital cataract mm. over the top. But if you look at the retinoblastoma picture, the eye, the baby's right eye um, has a very typical picture of the cloud, the cloudy leucoria. That so you can't see the back of the eye, you can't see the retina. That's what you will see. That you just can't see the red reflex. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, I've just got some statistics here. So. Uh, the prevalence of congenital cataracts in developed countries is about one to three per 10,000. So they're not that common, but um, they are important to pick up and they are missed um, quite frequently. So the next is the heart exam, making sure that um, you can hear normal normal heart if you would pick up a murmur it's generally a systolic murmur um and generally uh probably okay nothing wrong but the, the heart problem that you really don't want to miss is the co-optation of the aorta and you can check for that by the examining the femoral pulses so um femoral pulses as the picture with the fingers you uh you, the baby has to be um, have his nappy off and you are feeling in the groin for the femoral pulses. Now, I always find they don't like this. They don't mind the hip exam, but they really don't like you pressing to feel their femoral pulses. Um, so again, this is, um, it's not, if you can't feel femoral pulses, it's not, uh, if you can, sorry, if you can feel the Femoral pulses, it doesn't definitely mean that they don't have co optation of the aorta. And there are other signs, such as poor feeding, um, poor circulation in the lower limbs, and uh, sweating is a sign of um, heart problems in infants when they're feeding and not growing very well. Any more questions? No, we're good okay, for, we're we'll, good for we'll that. We'll do some of them towards the end Okay, as well. cool, cool. Um, medical students are taught to exam, examine for radial or brachial, brachial femoral delay. So that's where you're feeling for the brachial pulses at the same time for the femoral pulses. And if there's a delay, that may be an indication that there's something not quite right. Um, if you can't feel the femoral pulses, try the pedal pulses and the popliteal pulse. Again, if you were concerned and there's, there's no other um, issue, I would suggest that you bring the baby back to check if everything else is normal. Okay, so this is, um, this is a demonstration of how to do the hip examination, the Ortolani and the Barlow sign, and also the Galeazzi sign. Okay, so the, the key points for developmental dysplasia of the hip, and that and it's what we call that now, we used to, in my um, youth, it used to be congenital dislocation of the hip, but now it's called developmental dysplasia because we do know that the um, acetabulum is quite plastic and can, um, um, can become normal if there has been a, a, a problem with the hip. So asymmetrical hip creases occur in 25% of infants. So um, I get referred many infants with asymmetrical hip creases, but there are three um, key points that are risk factors. 85% of um, babies with DDH are female. Um, family history, again, is a very important Point to ask about because 
many are have a family history of um, DDH in the family and that if infants are breached for persisting longer than 34 weeks gestation certainly in my area all of these infants are now investigated and have an ultrasound once they're, they're born um, so earlier detection the better uh, as one to three percent of newborns do have DDH and Ortolani and Barlow's sign can be done less than three months old. You, it depends on how fat and chubby the infant size are, whether you can go up to five months. And as it was shown in the video clip, Galeazzi's is best beyond five months. Our local referral pathway is that if you pick a baby up, and I actually picked one up this, this morning, um, with an abnormal galeazzi's with one of the knees higher than the other um, and the baby was nearly five months they do want an x-ray before they'll see them in orthopedics hips should be checked twice in the first year and certainly in the well child book um, every one of the checks it it, it suggests you um, check for the hips undescended testicles is the um, is the other a uh, point that I would make a point of checking. Um, birth history of undescended testicles, um, prematurity and visible scrotal asymmetry all point towards cryptorchidism or undescended testicles. Um, UDT diagnoses are best made at, by eight months of age to uh, reduce confusion with testicular retraction and to facilitate timely orchiopexy. So uh, it's more common in premature infants because testicular descent from the abdomen to the scrotum normally occur occurs at about 28 weeks gestation. Most um, undescended testicles migrate into the lower scrotum within the first three months of life, presumably as a, a consequence of postnatal of a postnatal testosterone surge. Only one percent usually remain undescended by one year of age. So it's something at six weeks to definitely keep an eye on. Immunizations: the six-week check should be all about immunizations. Try and make it as stress free as possible. We give sugar solution if uh, mum doesn't want to breastfeed, and we immunize two people immunize the infant at the same time, so one in one in each, either leg. And this has not been evidence based, but our theory is that the uh, baby will only then feel because of the gait theory of pain. The baby will only feel one. Um, prick and there's lots of evidence around the value of sugar solution immunization appointment as suggested before uh, for the next immunization event at three months should be written into page 21 of the well child book and the parent should put the date and time on their mobile phone so now on to the mum is she being signed off by the midwife? Has she got contraception? Who is a social support? And most importantly, how is her mental health? And just asking a mom, they'll probably just say fine. So I think it's really important that you assess the mood. And both of these mood assessment questionnaires have been uh, validated for postnatal women P we use phq9 because we do have a well-being program that requires if we are if we do put the uh, woman into the well-being program they want the phq9 score um obviously the thoughts that you would be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way are very concerning but i always follow up on the uh somewhat difficult box if somebody ticks the somewhat difficult box and and um, investigate further so talking about well-being i talk about the calm app which is 
one of the uh, it's been rated very highly and there are quite a few free um, there are quite a few free items on it that the uh, you said the the woman can try talk about exercise getting out walking walking fast I talk about um, doing something just for them so getting your nails done if you like to have your nails done looking after yourself and talk about sleep and the importance of sleeping and trying to sleep when the baby sleeps I think there's certain critical um, problems that can make a woman more prone to postnatal depression and maybe an, a difficult baby um, certainly in my experience parents get very upset by reflux and the vomiting baby uh, how unpleasant it is to be smelling of vomit all the time um, I will let Helen have these articles if people want these articles that you can read about this was written by my husband who's a, who's a pediatrician who was very concerned when we first came to New Zealand 16 years ago about the numbers of infants who were uh, prescribed omeprazole without really um, any indication for it other than the fact that they were spilling and then colic and colic true evening colic with a baby who's very difficult can be very distressing for the for the mother um, there are a number of um, behavioral and um, not so much medications but there are things that you can try but I think certainly making sure that um, she's referred to the Plunkett nurse or, or sorry the well child provider uh, or the practice nurse or you um, if you're a GP or a nurse practitioner just keeping an eye on how the mum is if the baby's got colic and then these are the symptoms and signs of life-threatening mental health conditions in the postnatal woman I won't read them out but I've only ever come across one woman with uh, postnatal psychosis and it was very very frightening in terms of her thought patterns and the fact that she thought she was going to be her and the baby would be far better off if they were both dead and that I had to wait with her until we got the mental health people around and talking about mental health just uh, just a reminder that we are very uh, high up in the statistics for globally child maltreatment and neglect and that um, I think this statistics quite um, alerting is that women are more likely to commit neonatal side and that probably takes you into the early months as well um, or fatal neglectful supervision so woman's mental health is really important at the six week check and then if we've got time I was just going to go through a few are we all right for some other things that you that might come up in the six week check um, so jaundice uh, you need to um, find out from the midwife hopefully the jaundice levels by the time you see them you are uh, they are going down spots are always um, an issue um, spots are very common and very normal millial little millial mm -hmm. spots um, at six weeks just when everybody wants to take pictures of the baby hemangiomas start to um, they can they can develop at around six weeks uh, the thing about hemangiomas is it's very important to uh, refer them refer the baby to pediatrics if the hemangioma is across a structure that's going to develop for example an, an ear or um, a joint um, torticollis what you can do with torticollis is uh, gentle exercises ask the ask them to um, try and move make sure the baby's head is moved to the other side but if it's an issue then you can refer them to the physios and talipes and again as long as they're not um, as long as the foot can be everted and uh, there is no need to rush to refer them but keep an eye on if the if they're yes if they are concerned about 
um, a club foot. A club foot, Telepes Aquinavirus, will have been picked up at birth, hopefully. Resources. Most areas now have health pathways. These are these are excellent. Our, our Auckland resources are excellent. And then I am a great fan of the Royal Children's Hospital guidelines because these guidelines don't just give you uh, guidelines around a condition. They'll also give you guidelines around what to do with symptoms. And then um, these are the resources that I've used throughout this talk. Um, the Some of those dates are quite old, but I have been back to up to date to check that what we wrote about is still current. And that's it. Yeah. My talk is finished. <laughs> so all the resources and the slides and the video will be on our website um, to be able to be viewed uh, shortly after the webinar is finished. Um, we do have a few questions, though. So I'm going to take you right back to the vitamin D to start. OK. So uh, you mentioned that vitamin D, this is a new thing. And I think it's really important that we get a good idea of what we need to do here. So right. we're now giving vitamin D to babies. Yeah. That's funded. And how are we prescribing it? So I guess we. how is it given? How do you prescribe it? Right. How long for? OK. So um, it's called Puria, P-U-R-I-A. Um, if you search on MedTech on F10, uh, <laughs> you'll, it will come up, Puria. It's just vitamin D. It's one drop, and you can either put it on the mother's breast or just drop it into the infant's mouth. Um, if they're formula fed, they don't need it because the vitamin D is in the formula milk, but breastfed babies definitely. And especially if they're Māori Pacifica or dark skinned or mothers are uh, covered up, uh, many of our mums are vitamin D deficient. So if they're breastfeeding, they're, there's not going to be the vitamin D in the breast milk for them. And for a year mm. is the uh, recommendation. Mm. I think there's a lot of work going into vitamin D at the moment and... Um, so it's one drop once a day for a year is what they're thinking. Yeah. yeah. And if they change from being breastfed to formula fed during that year, can you stop? Yes. Yeah. Because okay. there's um, vitamin D in the formula milk. Okay. Brilliant. Um, how do you access the calculator? So the calculator that you had going through the sleep um, yes. risk. So how do you yes. Does everyone was, have access to that? I was wondering about this. I was actually going to um, contact. Dr. Christine um, McIntosh, yeah. whose um, research this was. If you can't get this sleep calculator, what I'd suggest is make a um, make a screening template, just like the six week template, in just like that one in your med tech, with mm -hmm. that information on it. Mm -hmm. Because it was just, again, it's just an aid memoir. Now, we can calculate the risk, which is part of uh, Dr. McIntosh's research. It, this is now, the the um, research is now finished, but we've still got the uh, form on our med tech. So almost the, the huge benefit out of this is, is making sure that you're asking all these All questions. these so questions, yeah. Going into more detail, I think yeah. you mentioned before, about yeah. not just skimming over, the, oh, you know, is, it, is baby safe while they're sleeping? Exactly. Actually asking about smoking and sleeping positions. Yeah, and asking about recreational drugs as well, because yeah. that's really important. Yeah. Um, and sorry, someone's gone back to ask, well, what is, was the benefit of the vitamin D? So the vitamin D was because we've found for, uh, that... There Many of our infants, particularly our dark-skinned infants, certainly in the winter, aren't getting sufficient vitamin D. Now, is, is dark skin any form, so someone's asked particularly around Asian children? Yes. 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 So, yeah. Asian yeah. children, um, children whose mums are covered up, um, so Muslim ladies who don't have their skin exposed to the uh, sunlight, mm. um, very much at risk. Mm. And Māori and Pacifica babies need four to five times more uh, sun exposure to, to get the correct amount of vitamin D than mm. New Zealand's European. Mm. And I guess, as, as you say, it's across the board as well because of our use of sunscreen and, and uh, covering yes. up in the sun. And also the way that in the winter, the way that the 
this is very technical, but the way the sun is in the sky, we don't get enough mm. the, the vitamin, the UBV rays. Mm. Mm. Uh, can midwives um, prescribe it? Yes. Yep. Brilliant. And um, in terms of the calculator, someone's asked if you don't have med tech. So obviously, if we, it's developing a um, a system within your whatever PMS you have. Yeah. Unfortunately. Exactly. Yeah. And you'll have these slides to look at, so yeah. you can see what kinds of information we put into our um, screening templates. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, we should be prescribing it to every baby who is not formula fed. So it's babies that are fed. fed. Yes. Especially, I guess, making sure. Do we increase the dose of the Māori Pacific? No, no. just okay. one drop. Yeah. Okay, so across the board. All right, so uh, someone's asked about, uh, could you talk to the finding of a small or almost closed fontanelle at six weeks? Yes, sure. As long as um, you are measuring the baby's head circumference and the baby's head is growing, there's no concerns about the fontanelle because even though it's small, the sutures won't be um few and well few, unless there's craniostenosis the, the sutures shouldn't be fused which is why it's important to check the baby's head circumference mm -hmm. okay um can you use an otoscope to look for the red reflex i don't think you'd recommend that no, no. you okay. need the ophthalmoscope okay yeah. and what is the age range for examining the newborn eye is there uh, can you examine it before six weeks? I yes, guess we, yes. Yeah. The, um, the baby check at hospital before they are let out, they should be checking for the red reflex. Mm -hmm. And with that refle red flex, reflex, I think there's still some, you, you talk to how the retinoblastoma um, looks. This, when you do a congenital cataract examination yeah. and then you check for the red reflex, you're still going to get a red eye. So you know how you talked about the yeah, congenital, no. yeah, we, you, know, you, you won't explained be, it before. Okay, so you won't get the red reflex in congenital cataracts or retinoblastoma. Right. Yeah. You won't see the red the, at the back of the eye. Um, and when you, when you don't see it, it's sometimes quite difficult to see it in brown-eyed babies. Um, but if you cannot see anything at the back of the eye, that is a, um, a red flag. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is the sugar solution that you use? Right. So, the sugar, <laughs> so the sugar solution is between uh, in the the literature suggests twenty to twenty four percent. So how um, I make ours up, it's just less than a teaspoon in fifteen mils of cooled boiled water, mm -hmm. and we draw up a mill mm -hmm. in a syringe. If we can, we get the baby to breastfeed because there is evidence that breastfeeding is as good as the solution. Mm -hmm. There's breast, there's sugar in the breast milk, mm -hmm. but it's a very effective pain uh, pain reliever. Mm -hmm. As the baby gets older, so you, at six weeks, it's the best thing to do is to make sure they have sugar. They um, for painful procedures in hospital in NICU, they use sucrose solution. Um, as the baby gets bigger and more alert you can use you can use massively distraction techniques like bubbles we find bubbles are fantastic for stopping them crying after they've had their immunization how do you approach the conversation if a mother is uh, reluctant or refusing immunization ah oh. that's <laughs> <laughs> a whole other topic that's a whole topic and what i do is show them imac the immunization advisory center and say please don't um please don't read um anything by anti-vaxxers please read the evidence base from our national immunization advisory center that gives very balanced um uh info well, it gives very excellent information i think if people are completely adamant about not vaccinating there's no point um, spending too much time trying to persuade them otherwise. Mm. Okay, yeah, let's move on from that mm. one, I think. <laughs> um, someone's asked about the, the baby that talks about lots of, the mum talks about lots of wind in the baby. Yeah. And I guess that's where you're talking the about the colic. Point. Yeah. So the colic article, um, what there is from Dynamed's 15-step uh, strategy for managing colic, so there's lots of uh, things that you can talk to the mum about. Now, if mum's really unhappy 
uh, finding it so difficult, which some parents do with colic because it some mothers do with colic because it's it's very unrewarding to have a colicky baby um you can give them a couple of uh a couple of three ideas to to work on each week and get them back to see you each week to check the mum's mental health now if you're as lucky as we are we have a um a unit just down the road where we can send our mums to for some help uh you Plunkett used to do um, family centres. Unfortunately, in our area, they've stopped doing them. But we have got this uh, fantastic resource. So what I would suggest uh, with um, gassy babies or colicky babies is it's the social, it's the support that the mother needs to try and work through some of the um, strategies that you can use and uh, this article which Helen will make available has got the strategies on there I, I'm, I will give Gaviscon um, like I said we're not sure about now um, proton pump inhibitors the omeprazole there's some real concerns about them in fact we were talking in peer review today about um, this withdrawal of uh, some of these proton pump inhibitors is because of the concerns about um, cancer development following um, stopping gastric acid. So I would steer away from medicating because often it's tr just trying to get the, the mum and dad through the first 12 weeks and using these strategies. So you can you say use the sugar, sugar water's good, they've got no teeth at um, six weeks, so you're not concerned about um, their teeth. Um, Infocol. Um, what else have they got here? Just dispel the pain um, theory. Dispel that pain myth that the baby's in terrible pain, because babies, the only way they can communicate is through crying, and they're not in terrible pain. It's just their way of communicating. Unless they've got something wrong with them, of course. Yeah. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. And we'll, yeah, so yeah, as make you mentioned, sure, we'll yeah. make sure those resources are on the website. Um, we have a question about how you fit your baby check, your yeah. mum's health check, yeah. and the immunisations all within um, a 12 Half to 15. An hour. Well, for, for the GPs, a 12 to 15 <laughs> minute consult. And you do, you do no. it within half an hour. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's um, I guess, for you know booking a consult that includes baby and mum for, for a 15, two 15, two 15 consults. minute yeah. consults. Yeah. yeah. Many, I mean, if I'm not doing them, the uh, practice nurse and the GP will do them and they'll have 15 minutes each so mm -hmm. the pract our practice nurse does practice nurses do the immunizations and the mental health screening mm -hmm. um and the weights if mm -hmm. the baby's uh needs weighing measuring do you have any tips for the flexural intertrigo inter rash that you get in those chubby cheeks oh yes yes the dribble rash uh, yes yeah. dribble rash um keeping it dry mm. um and i like pseudocrem mm. or vaseline mm. as a barrier mm. i think that zinc um and pseudocrem is a very wonderful resource because it's cheap from the supermarket yeah. or zinc and caster from the pharmacy on prescription yes, works really well right. to dry it out yeah um okay we're just uh so again just clarifying with the vitamin d it's for all children regardless of color or race if they're um, breastfed <laughs> uh, yes, if they're breastfed. Someone's asked, what what do you do if they're a mixed fed baby? I wouldn't, because uh, you don't know how much they're getting from the um, from the formula. So I probably wouldn't. Depends how much uh, mixed feeding. If it's only one bottle a day, then yes, give it. And, and the rest is breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Then I would give them the vitamin D. Mm -hmm. We're not as con nearly as concerned about vitamin D as we were about vitamin C because it was the vitamin mm -hmm. A in the vitamin C that was concerning. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D doesn't have the same, although it's a fat soluble vitamin, it doesn't have the same um, effects as the vitamin vitamin A does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, its benefit after one year of age, so obviously the recommendation is for up to the age of 12 months or one year. Um, is there any benefit in continuing? It probably, I mean, and it's probably worth it until they're outside and running around and getting their vitamin D from the sunshine because that's the 
best mm -hmm. uh, way to get your vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Okay, a number of questions come through about what age does the front frontal fontanelle close? Right. Do you, can you draw that from the top of your head, or is it? Yeah, ten. Yeah. It's ten months to twenty-four months. Okay. But if but I would always just err on the side of caution because some babies' fontanelles do close really early, mm. and parents. And that's why I showed the picture. Because let's look at the picture again. I'm gonna look at the picture again. Oh, yes, you can. Sorry, there we go. Um, if we go back to uh, if we go back to the fetal head, oh, should be the baby's head. You mm. can see those sutures. So even if the um, fontanelle looks like it's really close, the sutures won't be unless there's, they've got this rare condition called craniostenosis. And the way to detect that is through measuring the head. So it's important that you check them, the head circumference at six weeks, three months, five months mm. at their immunization visits. Mm. But that's the job of the Well Child um, Tamariki Aura Service. It's, um, it's always important to check that they are having those checks as well. And if they're not, then picking up on them. Mm. Mm. And in terms of um, the other end, what what age should we be concerned if it doesn't close? Oh, I don't know about that mm. one. Um, I've never I've never come across that to be mm. honest. Okay, no, we might have to look at look, look at that, that one up. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, what other? I imagine, and when you were showed us the side of your examination, you turn the baby over, and yeah. that would be when you would normally look at the spine. Yeah, the ventral suspension. Yes. yes. Okay. And yeah. in terms of um, defects within the spine, dimples and things like that, yeah. all of that. So yeah. you have your baby naked while you're yeah, yeah. examining yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and someone's asked about uh, looking for holes around the ears or the ear canal. Yeah. yeah. Um, for skin tags. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yes. So yeah. skin tags can be. Um, can be a sign of uh, renal problems. Um, often these are picked up now antenatally, you know, through the scans. Mm. Uh, certainly check that they've had, if they've got skin tags around their ears, you want to definitely check that they've passed their neonatal hearing mm. screening. Mm. And, and it's something to keep an eye on, yeah. to record and keep an eye on. There's a question about what tongue, a tongue tie looks like. Oh, tongue tie. Now there's a vexed <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, yes, tongue ties. I I would send any. I'm no expert on tongue ties, and to be honest, it's become very fashionable. I, I believe it's become very fashionable. Although, to be honest, the lactation consultants in our area do see the babies, and they can snip them if they think it's an issue for breastfeeding. Mm. Yeah, mm. I'm not. Okay. Yeah. I'm not the person to ask about tongue ties because I do think it's become something that's um uh yeah fashionable <laughs> do do you uh well someone's asked said can you talk about contraception at six week check yes um so I always check that uh they've been asked if they need contraception if they're not quite sure what they want to do, I give them condoms, uh, suggest that it's not a good idea to get pregnant straight away. Um, there are the options of, if a woman's breastfeeding, you wouldn't want to be giving them uh, the combined oral contraceptive, contraceptive, but they can certainly have the progesterone only pill and they can have depo provera too. Mm -hmm um and just have the conversation with them but uh, a good sort of stop gap is to give them a brown paper bag full of packets of condoms which we keep mm. um because we get them through the pso system um someone made a good point at, about a father's health check yeah at this point which I yeah. think is a really really great point to make it's a fabulous point to yeah. make and we only had this this morning actually we were saying there's so little at the moment for fathers and mm. you know with the fathers the, there are more and more fathers now taking over from the mom mom's going back to work at six months and fathers taking over and some fathers definitely there's now it's recognized they can get postnatal depression um so looking after them and making sure their uh mental health being checked is is really important mm. too. Mm. Um, 
watch this space because I I asked our practitioners to go off and find out what there was for mm. for fathers. Uh, I guess it's the same sort of advice you'd give to mums in that make sure you've got plenty of support, make sure you're doing something for you as well as, um, you know, looking after the baby, getting exercise. Exercise is a panacea. Um, get the endorphins going, working. Okay, someone's asked if you could please talk about fused labia in female babies. Have you had experience with that, Karen? Uh, no, mm. I haven't. No, I, it would that would be one for the paediatrician. Yeah, I would have said that. Yeah, as a referral. Because that's probably, uh, you know, you you might be looking at ambiguous genitalia. You mm. want to you want to make sure that you've um, ruled out any red flags there, mm. Mm. Um, because ambiguous genitalia uh, that can be associated with congenital adrenal hyperplasia so yeah mm. you'd want the pediatricians to see mm. you mean you can't can't ask them no. <laughs> why have you had a baby yeah. with that yeah. yeah uh you've mentioned in your slide around looking at the hips was that you have uneven hip creases in there was a percentage 25 of 25%, 25% yeah. is that right? 25% of um, infants will have uh, extra creases. Um, so it's not a worrying sign particularly. And the risk factors for developmental dysplasia of the hip are female sex, breach beyond 34 weeks gestation, and if there's a family history. Okay. And someone's asked then, related to that, is a deviated gluteal crease a concern, or is it similar where it's yeah. low, low sensitivity? Okay. Uh, do you talk about purple crying? Have you? Yes, purple yeah. crying. Yeah. I haven't been onto it, but it's a good website. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. Do you know it, Helen? It's a good resource, and yeah. it's something actually that would be um, great recommending for yes. yeah yeah I definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Purple crying, yeah. definitely. That's something to look up. Uh, right, there is, oh, can you talk about palm creases at the six week check? I, do you often check for palm no, creases? I don't check for palm creases, but it's a good point because yeah. um, you do know that they can be a sign of um, trisomy 21, mm -hmm. the uh, low, there's, there's less of a palm crease isn't there with mm. trisomy mm. 21 mm. but there would be other features too that might be concerning so looking at the baby before you do the physical exam and making sure their ears are in the right place and not don't have low set ears or they don't look um, um unusual um uh, that someone's actually written in Karen about the fused labia which um they say that it's now not treated and should resolve on its own at puberty usually. But I think in terms of reassuring a, a parent, um, that would be a great thing to refer on. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because you don't want to miss if there is something yeah. else, yeah. Uh, do you have any tips about managing constipation in babies and a colossal trop, something that you yeah, use? And how, yeah. how often do you use them? How long do you use them for? Yeah, um, um, I'm not sure I'd be using them at six weeks. Mm. Um, maybe suggesting some extra water. It depends on whether they're breastfed or not. Mm. Um, it's not something actually that's that common. Well, I haven't come across it that often at six weeks. Maybe it's older than six weeks. But mm. coloxyl drops, yeah, I use those um, in babies. And in terms of a percentile drop with your weight, yeah, uh, when do you can uh, when are you concerned? I think the standard that people talk about are two percentiles. Two, two centiles, yeah, so that's yeah, where you're yeah, at. that's standard. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what do you do when you find a baby that's dropped? Um, I would be referring them to paediatrics. Okay. Uh, do you do your hip checks in the same method as the video? It's very quite similar. I just yeah. showed that video because it's just easier to show on a baby than me try and explain how to do the Barlows and the Ortolani. It's definitely something that you get better and better at with practice. Mm -hmm. And you don't, uh, when I said that 
I find babies don't like you checking their femoral pulses, but they don't seem to care about having their hips checked, which seems strange mm -hmm. to me. But um, I very often find they're not crying when you do the, the hip check. Um, you've given some good resources around that at the Royal um, Children's mm -hmm. Hospital. There yeah. is also our Starship guidelines, yeah. which are wonderful. Um, and someone's written in about the, one of the Starship guidelines for thickening feeds uh, is suggesting corn film. Do you ever use it or have you no. had experience with it? No, no. It might be worth checking those yeah, Starship so guidelines as well. Um, the thing about Starship guidelines is I use the Royal Children's Hospital because it's like in the top 10. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Starship, but there's not the personnel to make sure that those clinical guidelines are updated in the same way as the Royal Melbourne Children's Hospital guidelines are kept updated. And it's if you use the Starship the guidelines, which many are fabulous, but just check the date of them. Hmm. Hmm. Um, uh, can you talk about the differentiating points between a diaper rash and a candida diaper rash, so a femoral one? Yeah, so um, with candida, um, usually get a diaper rash looks red and angry. Um, a candida rash usually has like satellite spots, mm -hmm. so it's it's different. It's good to look on some somewhere like Dermnet, and in fact, I think I put Dermnet as one of my sources of information on the end of these slides. So um, yeah, candida rash usually you've got. Um, sore area but with satellite spots around it whereas the um, dermatitis from nappy rash is red and angry and sort of extensive extensive yeah. yes and what antifungal what would be your go-to cream for the candida rash i think myconazole yeah, yeah. that's that seems to have yeah. been around and i, and I would all, yeah and i would also check the mouth and check yeah. the mother's breast too yeah. Uh, and actually, going back to that, someone's asked whether the, the breastfeeding mothers could be taking the vitamin D and whether that works. Does it transfer through the breast milk instead yeah. of giving the baby directly? Yes, it does. But uh, I guess the issue is if the mother's been vitamin D deficient mm. too, and we, and we don't know, and there is talk that we should be giving um, women uh, vitamin D too, because we are particularly at risk here especially in the winter, um, then the, she's got to make enough for her as well as for the baby. And if, the, mm -hmm. if it's safe for the baby, why wouldn't you give it to the baby? It's just one drop. And are we giving the baby this to the baby, the vitamin D to the baby, right from birth, or are we waiting till well, six Well, I weeks? give it to, at six. I don't see them before six yeah. weeks. So, yeah, I so give it not, at six weeks. not being prescribed by the midwives? midwives or, no, uh, but okay. they could be. Yeah. Okay, so it's safe to do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone's asked if you can just talk about the reflexes that you examine at the six weeks. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I did miss those out. So what I look for, I, um, it says in the... Um, when I was looking for the evidence, it, it said you don't if you if you've engaged with the baby, you've checked their um, social smiling and that their uh, their movements are symmetrical, and you've checked the ventral suspension. And I always check the morrow reflex. In fact, that's one that's mm. in the um, Well Child book. Um, I often do the stepping reflex just because it makes the parents smile. It's really it's nice. Lovely. Reflex, isn't it? Yeah. You can do the grasp reflex and get them uh, trying to pull them to sit up. Um, oh, yeah, that's basic. Basically, that's mm -hmm. that's what I do. Yeah. Some there's been also a question around whether tongue thrusting is a reflex or is it something that we should be worried about. I I would be quite concerned about that. Mm, yeah. Mm. So you wouldn't see it as a normal. No, normal, no not no. Okay. no. Okay. Um. And there's been a comment, just a comment, that raisins are very good when they're a bit older because it checks a really good pincer grip. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. um, breast milk for gunky eyes at that age, mm. does it work? Should we Apparently, be recommending yes, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I've certainly seen it work in patients. Yes, yeah. I've seen it work too, okay. yeah. And I think, again, you know, you, you want to try it. You don't want to be giving uh, chloramphenicol. You want to be yeah. uh, massaging mm. as long as the eye's clear. Mm. Usually it's a blocked mm. tear duct or, yeah. 
Now there, there's a question that's come in about babies who have inverted feet, however not telepies, and mm. if they start to wait there, they seem very pigeon-toed. Yes, that's. I think as long as you've got a full range of movements, yeah. and that's what I was trying to say before, you know, around the telepies. If you've got a full range, you can you can get the um, foot everted. Um, it's not such a it's not a, such a concern because mm. their feet are very malleable and flexible and as they grow i think they start everything starts to align a lot yeah. more yeah toddlers are often very pigeon toed yes <laughs> yeah but it's okay yes it is yeah. the um just a bit of child development here if if they're uh if they're walking on their tippy toes so past three that's something to mm. be concerned about mm. Mm. and refer them on mm. Uh, any tips on a red eye reflex with dark eye babies? babies? Yes, no, um, just persevere. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You'll get it is darker in darker, um, dark eyed babies. The reflex is darker. And again, back to the eyes. Uh, I'll read out the question. Okay. Uh, it says, does, does that mean if you can see the baby's fundi through the ophthalmoscope, but no red reflex? Is that reassuring or is that a red flag? I would say that's probably a red flag. Yeah, yeah. I think you have to see, you the, have red to see the red yeah. reflex. Yeah. yeah. And so that when you suggested standing right back yeah. and looking at them from far away. So you're not getting up close and looking at it from you look from, at, yeah. yeah. If you can't if you can't locate it when you're trying to look at both eyes, then one eye at a time mm -hmm. and just um, move around until until you can see it. Mm -hmm. And you briefly talked about jaundice and the neonate. Could you just repeat the tips, the, the short tips that you had around that? Right. That was, um, if there's a baby with jaundice, I would be wanting to know what their levels were and contacting the midwife mm. and making sure that, because the, the midwife generally won't um, discharge the baby if there's an issue. Um, so making sure that the, the midwife has, show as has got demonstrated that the um serum bilirubin levels are going down mm -hmm. and there is this phenomenon of course called breast breast milk mm -hmm. jaundice so uh as long as the baby's growing thriving feeding well um i wouldn't be too concerned but it's case by case basis mm -hmm. now my husband is a pediatrician always says if any concerns ring your paediatrician and talk to them they they would they like to have conversations with you about these things rather than referring mm. um necessarily yeah i think asking for advice asking is for advice yeah, yeah exactly and they're very friendly they are <laughs> uh what is treatment for cradle cap what do you use for cradle well, cap okay so uh i use i generally prescribe um sorbeline Setamacrogol because they can. It's very mild. It can be used as a um, soap in the bath, and it can be used as moisturizer. And uh, I suggest that they lather the um, cradle cap with the moisturizer, um, cooking oil, but not olive oil. Mm. Why not the olive? Oil? Olive oil has a fungus in it. Mm. Mm. I can't so, remember which one it is, but yes. Yeah, because I think there was, you know, it's sort of any oil and it would be fine and yeah. it's good for your skin, but just making parents aware. Yeah. Coconut oil. Um, well used. Mm, yeah. Too. And it smells beautiful. Yeah. Uh, if babies were prematurely born, will they still show the six week development that you expect at six weeks? No. <laughs> That's a good, yeah, good tip. Yeah, it's a good tip. Yeah. So you've got to take their prematurity away. So mm -hmm. if they were born four weeks premature, they'll only be two weeks at the six weeks check. Might be worth bringing them back yeah. again, yeah. Um, but definitely give them their immunizations and don't delay in immunizations. Yeah. Um, someone's asked if you could show the health pathway slide. Yeah, sure. Towards the end. There we go. It's worth uh, if you put in Google for your region at least. I know Auckland Regional Health Pathways come up, um, and, but there are pathways around the country. I think most DHBs now have health pathways. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and we have also have a comment that the Safe Sleep Calculator is on Health Navigator. Oh, New Zealand, excellent. Which is an incredibly good resource yes. as well to have. So the Health Sleep um, Calculator. Thank you for that. Great. Yeah. And you can have that up on your on your screen. Uh, someone's asked, would you use Sebazole shampoo? No. No, <laughs> because, it's, because you don't need that strong. No, that's no. quite strong for a, a little baby. I can't remember what's in it, but no, I would just. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. antifungal, isn't yeah. it? I, I think it's contraindicated. Okay. Yeah, in infants. And usually it will clear with just will. some friction and moisturiser, yeah. friction and moisturiser. Yeah. So uh, what I suggest is you put the cooking oil on overnight and then the next morning you pick it off mm -hmm. and then moisturise. But mm -hmm. don't pick it off till it gets red or sore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, someone said when suggesting use of oil, you need to give given good instructions for washing out carefully after leaving the overnight. Yes. So that's right. Uh, the sugar formula. So back to the sugar back formula. Back to the sugar formula. <laughs> okay. You just so, repeat that once more to right. So, people so know. the um, the studies. Sorry. No, oh, you're all right. Okay. Sorry. I'll sorry. The here. studies uh, suggest anything from twenty percent sucrose solution to uh, twenty four percent. Up to, I have read, it wasn't in these, but I have read 30%. So well, how I make it is just less than one teaspoonful of sugar. One teaspoonful is five grams in 15 mils of cooled boiled water. So the equivalent of 15 grams. And that will give you a just less than 30%. And then one mil of, um, one mil of, um, of the solution. Okay, so again, that some of that will be, be in, in those there, resources, yes, that's but right. um, it that's will also my be in the rule video. of thumb. Yeah, uh, and there's there's a couple of comments around the candida nappy rash. It um, often has slightly peeling skin, so you'll have satellite patches with peeling and redness, yeah. um, as opposed to the red angriness that you were talking about with a, a generalized nappy rash. Uh, and do you take eye swabs for chlamydia? When you have a sticky eye, and mm. what if it's yes, if it's persistent, okay, I wouldn't do it on the first okay. presentation, but if it's persistent, okay. And so, if you trial the breast milk and cleansing, yeah, yeah then I would do um, eye swabs. Okay. Just back to the um, candida again, mm. Dermnet, look on Dermnet yeah. about the difference in the um, rashes. And one last question that we have time for is, um, so we talked about checking the ears and the skin tags. Yes. And so someone's mentioned the preauricular pits that you can get, so the little dimples. And I think it's similar to a spine dimple, isn't it? Just as something that might alert you to something else going on. Going on, on yeah. And I, that re warrants a referral further to yeah. check. Yeah. So just checking, I think, around the ears, um, checking for the skin interior skin tags and yeah. the preauricular yeah. pits as well. And referring those on, those babies on. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. And it's been a wonderful talk. And I think um, we've covered almost everything a number of times. So hopefully um, everyone's got all their questions answered here. Uh, and we're looking forward to the next webinar in a couple of weeks. So see you all there. Good night, everyone. Good night.